I am joined by Jake Johnson. You know him as an actor, but today I am talking about his directorial debut, Self-Reliance. But first, Jake, I've got a problem. My podcast is not as successful as yours, so I was curious if you could help me out. Yes. You know, that's a, you're coming to the We're Here to Help. You're starting with a question. What, what's the problem, sir? You need a more successful pod? Yeah, so I'm hoping that I could just start Spider-Man, Spider-Man, Spider-Man right at the top to make some news. <laughs> I love it. You're gunning. You're gunning. I love no, it. So uh, question number one, do you feel like you relate to Bradley Cooper and Ben Affleck and Clint Eastwood now more than you ever have? Well, you know, we're all part, we're all the best of friends. <laughs> and yeah, you know, we all get together and just chat and hang out and uh, do our Pelotons together. No, I'm done uh, fucking around with you, man. So I, I I am curious, what are some of your favorite sort of manhunt greatest game films? The one that come to mind for me are The Running Man, Fincher's yeah. The Game, yeah. The Hunger Games, kind of. So I'm curious yeah, totally. what some of those touchstones for you are. You know, more so for me was um, um, there was a Japanese reality show. I think it was the late 90s, early 2000s about a guy who, a comedian who won the award and was awarded on the show. And he was put in, his, in an apartment and they stripped off all his clothes and they filmed everything. And then he soon realized that there was no food. And the only way he could get food and clothes was to win it from uh, uh, newspaper ads and like magazine clippings and, you know, call in radio shows. And the fun of the show was he was a really funny, likable character, but he was starving. And he was going through a really intense, you know, experience that was fun for the audience, but not fun for him. And I remember when I, my friends and I first started discovering these shows and talking about them, I thought culturally that was so wild to push somebody to a degree where we all know they're not happy, but it is really good entertainment. And so that was more of the desire to do this than those other movies, although I loved all those other movies. I do love a movie where, you know, Hunger Games I really liked. You said that that was in uh, Japan? Yeah. Because they have this huge show where they send kids out to the store to yes, like Yes, hundred percent right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what the hell? Yeah, these shows are crazy, they, but they're so entertaining. There was a whole channel there. They do wild stuff. They push. Yeah. It. I mean, nowadays, Mr. Beast is doing all those things in a day. Right. Yeah. But that, but that right. type of human experiment of like to to two people in a warehouse and have them not leave for a month. When those first ideas started coming up twenty years ago, it was blowing my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the first things that comes up in the film is the Lonely Island title card as they yeah. produce the film. I'm curious about your relationship with those guys and how the partnership on this came to be. Did you call up Sandberg and be like, yo, dude, I've got a hilarious idea. I'm going to scream. I'm going to kill Andy Sandberg a bunch in this movie. <laughs> uh, so I've known those guys for you know 15 years, just kind of around doing different projects and being near each other. I'm obviously a huge fan of theirs. Uh, all three of them, Yorma, Akiva, Andy, they're all killers in their own right. And then together, they're a hell of a team. But this actually came from their executive, Allie Bell. So I had worked with Allie Bell. She used to work with Ivan Reitman, and we did No Strings Attached together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Allie was one of the uh, producers on that movie. And she and I had, you know, just become friends on that and had been trying to find a project for years. And I sent her this script. And she liked which it, you wrote, which I wrote. Yep. Yes. And then she sent it to the guys. They liked it and said they would be willing to produce it. And then Andy and I had a Zoom during the pandemic. And he said uh, that he would be happy to play the character. Did you originally, write it with with him in mind or not originally? Originally, it was kind of could be anybody. And I was going to write for whoever it was. And so the idea, it could have been, you know, I was open to ideas there. And then when Andy came on board, we had a big conversation. I got really excited about it being Andy. And then he said, yes. He, first of all, the charm of your film reminds me a lot of the charm of his Palm Springs film. Sort of that same kind of wacky left of center rom-com type vibe. Yeah. Um, is, but I do feel like, speaking of charm, I feel like you did have a bit of a cheat code here. Is getting Anna Kendrick to play your charming lead kind of a cheat code? Because I feel like it is. Doesn't hurt. 
<laughs> I mean, what I, honestly, as a director, what I really believe, and this is probably because I'm more of an actor, uh, is cast really matters. Mm. And I, I personally am a big believer that cast is 90% of the thing. I didn't micromanage anybody as a director. I didn't give Anna that many notes. We would have discussions about what I kind of thought about the thing. But once an actor takes control of a character, they care. Certain actors aren't ready for it. And they're really nervous and they want a lot of direction. They want to be told what to do. And they want, after a take, they look to you and they want you to tell them how to do it. Those aren't the kind of actors I get excited to work with. I like actors who read it, do their homework, have an idea and kind of come in. Biff Whiff's a great example of that. Oh, dude. And he's a killer. But everything he did... You know, that was not me sitting there going, so now I need you to eat a chip. And then at this moment, as like my note to him was pretend it's real life and get invested in it. And when we're in a scene, your job as an actor is to forget there's a camera and just be James and live in it. The family, Mary Holland, Emily Hampshire, Daryl Johnson. I have one about that too, yeah. I, I, I won't jump around then, but... I want to give you your props for sort of the way that you tried to... Uh... Is it Biff Whiff or Whiff Biff? Biff, Biff Whiff, right? Biff Whiff, yeah. Um, probably my favorite line in the film, and it's so naturally said. He's been like, dude, I, I never told you my name was... Yeah. Uh, I forget what it was. He was like, you yeah, just yeah, started yeah, calling yeah. me that. And like, <laughs> so like that, I feel like, is exactly sort of what you're trying to get at there. So there's two moments for me that uh, when I was writing that character that I thought of, I needed the, the actor to nail. It was that line where he goes... I never told you my name. My name is Walter. You just started calling me James. <laughs> to nail that took like, you needed to be the certain actor. And the other one was when we reveal him when I'm talking to Natalie Morales's character and he's standing there. That moment when the camera sees him needs to be a laugh as opposed to a sad moment. Yeah. And so you kind of, as an actor, I needed somebody who could hit both. Yeah, for sure. He could, um, he could. I hate to ask such a basic thing, but the premise of this was so unique that I'm genuinely curious. Did this idea to you come during COVID when you were forced to spend time with a certain yeah. person for a long time? Yeah. Well, and well, yeah, uh, who? Yeah. Yeah, who? <laughs> well, the original idea happened years before. So this was something I wanted to do as like a uh, like a mini, like whatever a mini series is called now. I forget the actual term, but whatever it gets nominated for awards, the mini series. Anthology? And something like in six, six episodes, six to eight episode season. And I wanted to do two or three of them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then I pitched it to Netflix. They passed on it and it went away. Limited then, series. Limited series. That's the word. That's I wanted to do it as a limited series. And I thought back then when Netflix and all these streamers were new that I could be on New Girl and still do those. And I could do them the way you could do like a, a movie over the summer. And then when that went, went away, I'd only seen it as a limited series. And then during the pandemic was the first time I was really feeling the themes of this movie. And I thought... I'm not going to be able to get financed for a limited series and I'm not going to be able to get the cast I want to commit to multiple years. But if I do it as a little indie movie, I could probably get a great cast and I could probably get it financed if I'm willing to direct it and be in it and have all those check marks already filled. Cause if you, when you want to like get a different director, you have to attach people, you got to go through all the steps and those roadblocks become really problematic in raising money. So the family scenes felt so uniquely and starkly real. Yeah, just tell tell me about those. The mom, the sister, it pulled right. It felt yeah, yeah. pulled straight from your life. It's not your life, but I'm saying like it yeah. felt like it felt like real I life. felt like I knew these people. You know, yeah, what I mean? same with me, totally. Yeah. So that uh, that was really important to me. I originally wrote this to take place in Chicago, and I wanted it to feel like a regular family in the middle of America, and this is the way your family would react and you know them. And Grace Alley, her production design, that was an abandoned old house in Pomona. The way she built that made it yeah. feel like such a real, like, For sure. grandma's house. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, honestly, for me, it's the actors. So I started with Mary Holland. Mary Holland, who plays the elder sister. Uh, so my, funny. Oh, my compliment to her is always, I feel like she's a Phil Hartman type. Mm, uh, wow. in that yeah. I just really do like if you watch her work like I can't but like she's a woman who's going to have a certain moment where she takes over she could do everything 
Like she can hit a dramatic moment. She can also play broad. She can also play like really crazy comedic and she could do subtle. Most people can do like two or three of them. And so she was, uh, she was a first hire for me. And once I had her, I knew we were really great. Then Daryl Johnson's a guy I had seen in a commercial like nine years ago. And I had tried to find him for years and when I wrote this, I wrote it with him in mind. And this character's name used to be that guy from the commercial. And then Emily Hampshire, I found, I met her during auditions and she was just so funny that once those three came together, we would rehearse at my house. And I was honestly like, man, the three of them, this is a show. I know them. I feel them. The mom was so good. I felt like I could live in those scenes forever. Those scenes are kind of weirdly the key to the film too because they're like the sit-in for us right yes, and okay. but, the, but but the key to them is they have to deliver this exacerbation and yes. doubt also with tons of love and that's yes, not great really, yeah and that's not, and that's not a, if, that, if that so there's a few scenes in the movie that i think for me were make or break scenes and the first really so the andy scene for me is not a make or break scene when he comes on because that's just funny i was not worried about that scene at all I was like, you got Andy Samberg in a limo. It's going to be funny. He's one of uh, those guys, too, that just like, he, he's just funny. He's so funny. Yeah, just uh, his face, the way he every, carries himself, every, his grin, everything about but, him is funny. When the window goes down and he says hi, because yeah. I've now seen it in the theater, but it gets a huge laugh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was not too worried about the hosts, who I think are excellent. The guys, the brothers with the right. turtlenecks. Uh, those dudes. Those guys, oh, Danish, oh, German. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> they're whatever they want to be. <laughs> I'll tell you what they are. They're perfect. Uh, and they're just killers. They're so good. The costuming is so good. Their performance, their long hair together, and their accents. Yeah. I wasn't worried. The yeah. scene where I go home and tell the family for the first time, and they go, ah, oh, Andy Samber. <laughs> In order for the audience to leave that scene and go, I'm on board, was the scariest part of making this movie. Because if yeah. they leave that and say, first of all, the family are assholes, then we're in trouble. If they leave it and say, Tommy's fully insane, then I don't think we have a movie either. So, and it can't be Tommy because Tommy just is saying what he saw. Right. So it was all on their coverage. And I was like, it was re I was really nervous. And when they were hitting it, I felt like, oh God, good actors are the best. And now I'm... Um I'm curious, did you intend for us to start to doubt you? Because mm -hmm. that's not what I expected yeah. the film to be. And when that, when you do yeah. that first scene, I was like, wait a minute. What? Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay. I Honestly, for me, I kind of wanted uh, the movie to be a lot of different things. Uh, I didn't want to make a, at least, I mean, look, it would have been nice to make a really buttoned up movie that everything was really clean. But I, I wanted it to be a manic movie. Mm. And I wanted it to feel like a lot of different things. And I wanted you to be with Tommy, doubt Tommy, be with him, doubt Tommy. I wanted the moments to be thrillery, to feel a little tense. I wanted the moments that were comedic to feel comedic. And I wanted the romantic stuff to feel romantic. And I wanted to give you a lot in 90 minutes. And so I wanted you to go on that ride, ideally, where you said, is this fucking real or not? What the hell is this? Because And then at the end, um, and I'll cut this part out because it's about the end. You... Well, we had a lot of different versions of the ending. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, we just did. Um, there was there was a lot of gamemanship in post with the editor and I. Mm. And we put it in front of different crowds of how you end it. Mm -hmm. Because there... <laughs> you know, like, that's a fun... That's, you see, that's, that's the choice that you can make if you're on films three or four. But for Agreed. a first one, you got to kind of la land the plane a bit well, smoother. Honestly, you know, what's funny to say that is, and please, uh, you know, this is hard because these are spoilers, so I don't want to waste too much time on it because I don't want this in there. I remember one time you were like, I got this whole directing thing, man. Or, or one time where you were like, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? I would say every night... From prep through the wrapping of the movie, I had the, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, the workload was just different than I was used to. A lot of decisions that I don't overvalue, uh, that I don't make as a producer, as an actor, uh, were my decisions. 
if there was a character in the deep background, what kind of shirt they were working, like it where all right, it Fincher, relax. But like that kind of stuff, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but you have to make decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my like, girlfriend hates that. I'm like, I'm indifferent. I don't care. She's like, I need you to make a decision. Yeah. So a lot of stuff I find certain things really important. And if I don't find something important, I have no opinion. So there's a lot of stuff my wife will like. just decide. Yeah. And I'm happy with her decisions. Yep. I didn't realize as a director, that's not a charming answer. Yeah. Because it's someone's job and they'll be like, if Fuck it doesn't me. go well, it's on you. So yeah. what do you like more? And I'd be like, uh, I don't know. Put him in a gray shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then gray, you can't see him. He blends in exactly. with the wall. <laughs> but the moments where I felt like I got this truthfully were my uh, the DP of the movie, Adam Silver was such a sweet partner and he could have made me look bad in moments, but he never did. Mm. And if we ever on set weren't seeing eye to eye, we would quietly talk and figure it out. Cause a lot of times it would be, I was technically making a mistake and he was saying like, I hear you, but if we, and then he and I would kind of talk and I realized when he was a true ally, I was like, man, he could kill me in front of this crew and the crew would rock with him and he never did. So I felt very confident with him. You, they just can. I've watched yeah, yeah. DPs murder directors. Right? <laughs> just murder them in like really subtle ways. Just kill them. Because you've got like the general who's like very disconnected from like the soldiers, but then you've got the lieutenant who's there but like the ride DP, or die. The crew works for the DP, but yeah. the director is the boss. So you're like, yeah, yeah. yeah kind of, buddy, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I realized he was a, a real ally and we were trying to make the same movie, I felt really safe. Uh, and then um, the cast, when I realized that these actors were on board and trying really hard, because I've also been on sets where actors are kind of phoning it in and I don't get it on an indie where I'm like, motherfucker, I know you're not being paid. Try Right. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know why you took the job. If your attitude is like, whatever, when do I get to leave? I'm like, mm. you fought to be here, you geek. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And everybody yeah. came on this movie. People would have their notes. They were like, oh, can I try this? And I thought like, yeah. I think that that's props to you, though, because they didn't want to let you down. I think that that speaks to both the, the crew that you put that's together true. and sort of who you are as a that's leader. Nice. But they did it. They And so I felt a lot of times like. I would be sitting at, you know, a lot of times I'm in the scene with people, but the camera, if I'm off camera, I'm looking at the monitor. And as I was looking at the monitor during their performance while trying to connect with them, I would think like, this take is so good. If I just use this, I know I'm good. Yeah. And that okay, was now, a real release. Sorry, Jake. Uh, before I move on to some of your past works, I just want to shout out Dan Romer. He, his oh. score, his score for Maniac is one of my favorites all time of all time. He does the score for this film. So just shout out to Dan. Fantastic Dan artist. Dan Romer is brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So Jake, the last time I spoke to you, you were not a director. You were voicing a basketball coach. A little different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going Spider-Verse. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> no, because the last time I spoke to you, you gave me an absolutely incredible story about get him to the Greek. So I am hoping today that you could do the same for me for 21 Jump Street, because what I find in both of those films is that you're in it for one scene and it's yeah. low key, probably one of the funniest of the whole film. I just watched some of the clips on YouTube last night and you being like, OK, let's do that again and pretend you guys aren't weird. You still <laughs> laugh out loud hilarious. So just talk to me about like filming that scene with Jonah and Channing and what comes to mind. You know, it's funny you bring that movie up because... Because uh, it made thinking... your career in a weird way? Because that's how you met Phil and Chris. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, but I was thinking a lot, you know, I've been talking to some friends about a project um, and I just really miss big comedies that are just for comedy's sake. Mm. There's no lesson in them. There's nothing in besides real funny people trying to be really funny. And what was great about that movie, I mean, that was Chris and Phil. You know, oh, they're wow. now doing this. Thing. And like you had Jonah, you had uh, Channing, who was so funny. You had all these killers. But a funny Channing story. is a revelation in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's also so funny. He's a, yeah. really, a super nice guy, too. Yeah. So but Dave ahead, Franco, sorry. you had Brie Larson. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> murders. Yeah. Um, but a funny story about that one was on my I was there for three weeks in New Orleans to shoot two scenes. And 
I had gotten dropped off and it was the summer before New Girl. So my head was really spinning. We had shot the pilot. We were waiting to get picked up. Uh, I knew a lot was going to change in my life. And I had uh, I, I was at like the hotel pool by myself and I see this really nice suburban guy. And he walks up and he goes like, hi, huh, you're Jake. And it was Rob Riggle. And he goes, hey, I'm Rob Riggle. And he goes, you're in this movie too, friend? And I go, yeah. And he goes, uh, what are you up to? Are you here with family? And I was like, no, I'm alone. And he's like, okay, great. And he goes, here, I'm here with my lovely wife. And this really nice woman waved. And he goes, I'm taking her to the airport at 12. What's your room number? Perhaps we'll get lunch. And I said, yeah, great. And so I gave him my room number at 12.01. There was a pounding on my door as if I was being attacked. <laughs> and I opened the door and Riggle standing there with moonshine. And he was like, he's like, this moonshine came from Channing. Let's go. And he and I partied for, I think, 40 hours straight. And I just remember there was like a moment where it was like six in the morning. We we're both either naked. Oh, hey, Rob, I'm sword. Jake, by the way. I didn't get your name. <laughs> we're in a sauna. And, and I was like, had these glimpses of blacking out where I'm like, this is the wildest 40 hours I've had in a while. And then that kind of got me into the mode of like, all right, everybody in the cast would go out and hang and party and have fun. Yeah. Rob became a friend for life, but I was definitely not in the the vibe. And then Riggle just ripped the bandaid off. Yeah. Well, he, him, he, him one too of the is, in, is in a few where he's like, put your tongue, put, put it back in there. Uh Rob <laughs> Riggle is one of the funniest things on planet yeah for real i don't want to call him a person he's a thing so i want to have a spider-verse chat in a nuanced way if that's remotely possible uh and not just try to clickbait it what do you think chris and phil on, and the creative team at large understand about this character that's made these films such a not incomprehensible hit but i don't think anybody knew the way it would turn out I personally think it is a deep passion for the fan base in a way that transcends studios and money. I think the way they care is just different. Like for the first one, you know, just in terms of the way contracts work, as an actor, you get paid for 10 records and everything after that is like a renegotiated deal and it's the money gets goofy. Um, and I've never gone over that because your movies and TV shows are a business run by huge corporations in order to make a profit. If they happen to be good or not is secondary. And so if you're making something and it's good, it's really crazy that it was good. You know, like you had to fit all these things. Like there's a budget, there's days. Like our movie, Self-Reliance, we shot this in 17 days. And that's because we had a budget and our budget was budgeted for 17 days. Chris and Phil do not stop until they think the movie's right. And so I think what happens is you just have people who love so deeply this project and these characters, and they're the first fans. So I think the reason it's hitting so hard is they don't stop until their like inner fan is satisfied. You, and as an actor in it, it's awesome to be part of. I love to ask this of folks who are part of something that is genuinely great. And I think that these films are. Do you have a specific moment that sticks out in your head where it all kind of clicked to you? Like, oh, shit, this is going to be this, this is going to be special. Um, in the first one, when um I was doing a, I think it was the first one where Peter saw MJ um, and wow, got sad seeing her. Yeah. Um, and as a voice actor, a lot of times you go in there and you're being really micromanaged. And it's, can you say this line like this a little bit faster? Can you just say that word? We can splice it in. And then you hear everybody talking and they'll go like, use the word from the third line and the word. And you go like, all right, you guys will find it. And we did so many takes of that. That's fucking annoying. Lighting. Sorry, but that's like a crazy way to build a film. I mean, I, I know that well, that's how they all, do but things, but... but... Every project is different. And the part of this business that people don't, I guess, you know, because it's not the fun part, and they say it in like sports, is it's a business. Right. And every once in a while, you jump on a project and you're all passionate and you realize, oh, this one's just a business. Yeah. 
and then you jump on another one. I have an idea of what film of yours you might, you might be <laughs> hinting at. So yeah, I'll. No, I'm not I'll part keep... of that. No, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not with you. <laughs> I'm not making some fake news on that shit. No. I'm keeping my mouth you. quiet. I would never do that to you. Um, but now the serious question: Who would win in a fight? Your Spider-Man, Toby Spider-Man, Garfield Spider-Man, or Tom? I'm just kidding. I am just kidding. <laughs> uh, Jake, I see you've got some storyboard notes back there. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. What uh, can you tease that? Yeah, so all? this this has become the uh, so this is my master closet. <laughs> and uh, now that I'm doing the podcast, we started uh, the podcast. We were here to help started with my buddy Gareth Reynolds, and we were just going to do ten for fun during the strike. And then you know we just started doing some pretty good numbers pretty fast, and we had a we got a base faster than I expected. So those are different episodes. We have a lot banked. We've just recorded with a lot of different people, so we're about fifteen episodes ahead. And I like seeing them that way so that we can start like building what shows and, you know, figure out if we're getting in patterns and kind of mess with it. But that's what I use right if I'm doing like a movie or a TV show and now it's mm. a podcast. I just uh, checked out the one with Boban today. What a mensch that guy is. Oh, he's such a prince. How, he's the- how'd you guys link? So I wrote this part with him in mind. Be- uh, because you well, saw him in John Wick 3, of course. No, honestly, I I saw him in those commercials. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's really funny. Yeah. And I thought, like, man, it would be so funny if the person who attacks Tommy on the first one, because every every scene in this movie needed to be funny when Tommy explained it, right? So I thought, all right, he gets attacked, but then when he tells the bouncer what happens, what could be unrealistic? And I was like, all right, so what if he was a giant? And then if you just cast a tall guy who's 6'6", well, that's believable. So I was like, what if I found somebody who was like 7'6"? Yes. And there, there's just not a lot of people like that, you know? Yeah. And so then I thought like, and I need his lines, his face and his lines to be scary, but also a little funny. And I was like, oh, if Bowman does it, he's just perfect. And so I think I just reached out to him on social media and on uh, Instagram. Hey, dude, I think you're perfect for this role that's scary and a bit funny. Yes, I was like, and then I sent him the script and I was like, if you want to Zoom and we got into FaceTime. And uh, the reason I had him on the podcast, too, is what I didn't realize is just how funny he is and how charming yeah. he is. Yeah. He walks in a room and everybody loves him. Yep. He seems like such a great guy, just such a vibey kind of chill guy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so then I was like, I just, I'm like, man, I would like to work with you forever. Yeah. Jake, man, congrats. I'm sure this is a huge, you know, it's a big deal, man. How how long did this take from start to end? You know, the writing was kind of on and off for a few years and then pre-production was probably about four months. We shot it in 17 days. Oh, Uh, yeah. Nice, Uh, man. It was, it was manic. Yeah. Uh, And then. We edited it and we were able to do a couple different rounds of reshoots, which were really nice and helpful, where you put it in front of an audience, you get notes, you have great discussions and you tweak it. And so we probably took about eight months to a year to edit it down. Uh, Ryan Brown, the editor, is just, he's an old, we've worked together since Paper Heart. He's just a killer. Mm. And then, you know, the final touches, a lot of it with the Dan Romer score, sitting with Dan in his basement. And when that kind of came together, once we found the score, Hmm. Then I felt like, all right, now we got a movie. And because I think the score really sums it up and that it's like really scary, really intense, but it's also ridiculous. Like he's doing that stuff on like, you know, garbage bins and two hitting two by fours. Huh. It's not like beautiful percussions. Yeah, yeah. He's great. Well, Jake, congrats, man. Uh, you come across as one of just the easiest guys to root for in the business. So I hope that that translates to your film, which hits Hulu on January 12th. Self-reliance. Thanks. Buddy. Thank you, Jake.